So before I start, um, I thought I'd do something a little different this time. I already put this presentation on our website. So if you want to go to vichydal.org and click on presentations, you can actually download it, follow it along, PDF version. Because uh, we always have people asking at the end, when, where can I get this? Well, you know what, here it is. It's right there, right now. You can follow along, you can skip ahead and leave early if you want. I don't know. But uh, go right ahead and take a look at it. Um, so here's the presentation itself. <clears throat> um, just as a, a kind of disclaimer here, Vici Dial runs on asterisk. Uh, I don't specifically state that until probably the very end of this presentation, but um, you know, I, it, it's not mentioned here. I just wanted to, to mention to everybody that it does run on asterisk. Uh, we currently support uh, up to asterisk 13. Um, we usually don't bother with the short-term releases, which is why we haven't touched 14 or 15 yet. And of course, 16 just came into being a couple days ago. Uh, and we usually let uh, new trunks uh, age nicely for a couple of months while bugs are worked out before we start hitting it with our, our high uh, volume call center uh, junk. Uh, <laughs> we, we have a testing suite that we use. It's actually built into Vichydial where we can have it call itself over and over again for days. And we test things like the, uh, the crash rate and the memory usage and all sorts of stuff like that uh, to, to try to expose bugs. And, that process takes a while, and um, I'm not going to go over the, any of that today. I just wanted to give a little disclaimer. Yes, Vici Dial runs on Asterisk. Asterisk is the core uh, of the uh, telephony engine. Uh, we don't use any Asterisk queuing uh, or any of those type of applications. Everything else, all the queuing, uh, all the agents, everything is done in Vici Dial itself. So that's how we have clusters and when you have clusters sometimes you want clusters to talk to each other um, so the application in this uh, the first half of this presentation is all going about how we were able to get clusters to talk to each other easily so the application we had uh, this was actually for a charity campaign uh, for one of our clients you have a separate fronter cluster of servers you know vichydal cluster has a main web server or a uh, main database server, a couple of web servers, maybe a few Vichydal telephony servers, depending on the scale, how many agents and how many lines you need to support. And then <clears throat> we have clients, several clients actually, that will send calls from their cluster uh, of fronters or qualification agents through to a verification cluster, uh, which is a separate cluster with different database, different users, different lead base, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, the application is basically to allow uh, customer information, name, address, phone number, uh, account codes, details like that, to be sent along with the phone call uh, to an agent on a separate VichyDial cluster. The challenge, of course, was to make this easy uh, and web configurable, uh, as well as the security side of it, limited sharing of customer data, because of course there are unscrupulous companies out there who, if they get a direct database connection into your system, will try to suck everything down and use it for themselves. Yes, that has happened to clients of ours that gave database access to their partners. So we had set up a few companies to do some limited uh, uh, sharing of data, of lead data, customer data. Uh, it generally involves a lot of custom manual configurations, going into conf files, adding things uh, manually on every server in the clusters, both sides, so that the calls could pass through. Um, limited database access from one cluster to another. Now that was a bit tricky uh, and usually ended up sharing too much or too little. Uh, and then some custom scripting on both sides to be able to handle the data. Um, it was not a good solution because it's very difficult to set up, easy to make mistakes. Uh, if you add another server, you have to go back and reconfigure stuff on both sides. Um, the data security side is incredibly difficult, especially if you want to limit it to live phone calls only. Uh, and it's very time consuming if you have to update or modify it. So the solution that we came up with in the last year was a whole new set of VichyDial settings and features. Everything's web configurable through uh, web admin, uh, and it allows for limited live call only data sharing uh, of live transfer calls. 
So I'm going to go over each of these in detail, um, but it's basically uh, we use EEX, IAX, to connect between servers. And we also are going to be using that same uh, trunking technology to connect between the clusters. Um, <clears throat> first, you set up an IAX carrier on the fronter cluster with a dial plan entry. So the fronter cluster is actually going to act as a carrier sending an inbound call to the closer or verification cluster. Um, it's going to do that through an IAX phone account uh, on the verification cluster that's set up to use trunk inbound, which is our default DID routing uh, trunk inside of each dial. Uh, we created a couple of new API functions. Um, so you're going to have to create an API user to be able to share that customer data uh, from the fronter cluster. Um, you're going to have to set a transfer preset to go to the DID that you're going to be sending the calls into on the verification cluster. And, and on the verification cluster itself, you're going to have to set up a DID, a call menu, an in-group, and a settings container uh, to be able to communicate with the fronter cluster. Uh, and again, all of this is done through the web admin. So here are the screens. Uh, these might be easier to see on your own uh, laptop. But uh, basically, this is uh, a cross-cluster communication, that's what we call it, CCC, uh, carrier that's set up on a fronter cluster. Um, it's uh, pretty simple and a standard one. Uh, you've got the, the registration string so that the, the two servers uh, will register to each other. Uh, you've got the account entry, um, the global string so that you can use it in the custom dial plan entry. And then in this case, we're using uh, 7.4, as the dial prefix. That's important because you have to use in your campaign settings 74 um, in this case as a three-way dial prefix so that you can do the transfers that way. Uh, we're going to jump to the verification cluster. You notice the fronter cluster is purple, verification cluster is red, uh, so you can better keep them, keep track of them. Uh, this is the phone that you need to set up. It's, it's fairly simple. Um, you set it up, the dial plan number 8300 in Vichy dial by default just hangs up immediately. So that's why we use it for these, because we're not planning on actual phone calls coming in without any uh, extension set to them. Um, so we set it up pretty, pretty standard uh, as a normal phone account. Of course, you want to use a, a strong registration password. But you'll notice the notes at the bottom, the phone entry must have the outbound caller ID and the full name field set to blank. That is very important because if these are set to something, they're going to override every phone call that goes over uh, the caller ID information. So you want to make sure that that's preserved and make sure that the outbound caller ID and the full name fields are left blank so that none of that information will, will override uh, the transfer calls. So back to the front or cluster on purple here, uh, we have to add a user. And in Vichy Dial, API users are just regular users. Um, but we've got this little flag here at the bottom, API only user. That means you can't log into the web admin or the web agent screen uh, if you have API only set to one. So that's kind of important. That's a security thing. Uh, you can also limit the API functions that are allowed. In this case, I've got the uh, CCC lead info that we saw on the other screen. And we've got force fronter leave three-way. I'll talk about that a little later. That's also a function that works across clusters uh, in a CCC configuration. So we've got uh, fronter, again, still on the purple system, the fronter system. This is the campaign that the agents are in. Uh, you notice we've set a transfer conference number of area code 999, which doesn't exist. That's kind of important. You wouldn't want to overlap with a real phone number, although we have clients that have done that. Um, 555-4444. So what we're going to do is, and you'll see this in another screen, create a DID entry under that uh, on the closer system. But first, we have to, oops, we have to do a settings container. Now, we created settings containers a couple years ago as, as a way of just storing configuration data in a large text blob uh, in the database. That way we could use it in the database. We'd use it for 
uh, long, huge configuration strings on Perl scripts that we may run, want to run in a cron tab uh, without having to have you know, 5,000 characters of data in the command line string. Um, and we use it for uh, CRM configuration and integrations, and in this case, we use it to store the URL that uh, will connect to the API on the Fronter cluster. So this is the URL, and you'll notice we've got uh, how we do variables in Vichy Dial is we have dash dash capital A dash dash the variable name dash dash capital B dash dash. Uh, that was decided years ago based upon having to integrate with some uh, CMS content management systems that used every possible combination of every wacky variable that you could think of. So we had to think of a way of denoting a variable not using brackets or curly cues or ampersands or asterisks or dollar signs or carrots or any of those other special characters. So that's how we got to dash dash a dash dash. Um, so the call ID is important because that is what lets the verification cluster know where the original call came from, and it's what it uses when it sends that API call back to the fronter cluster to gather information on the customer. <clears throat> the uh, in-group entry, this actually is very simple. This is just a standard inbound queue in-group entry uh, on the verification cluster. Uh, the call menu does have some uh, special things in it. Um, the menu prompt, uh, in Vichy Dial, you can have an AGI script be a part of the menu prompt. So in this case, uh, we have Allison say, please wait a moment. And we've got the pipe that uh, signifies starting a new entry, and then that is the AGI script that performs the lookup. Uh, it references the settings container, and it is going to go and grab and then analyze the data. And if it finds a match, it's going to send the call to option A, which is right here, which goes to that inbound group that we just created. Uh, and it's also important to note the handle method is closer. That's because the lead's been defined. We don't have to search for the lead. This uh, new AGI script does all that for you. It looks it up, it creates a new lead, and it sends the call on. There are other options, option B, C, and D, which uh, the documentation goes into exactly what those are, but basically if the lead is not found or if there's some other kind of error, you can then send the call down a different path, uh, maybe to a general entry um, where you'll have to ask for the customer details. On the DID entry, uh, this is that 999-555-4444 that we already talked about. Uh, this just goes to that call menu we just looked at. And with all of this, the uh, configuration is done. That's it. All web-based configuration, just those uh, seven or eight screens and you've basically condensed what used to take hours or possibly days into a matter of minutes. So the result for this client, um, they had a rather huge single system. They were having some issues being able to do some of the things they wanted to, including expand. So we created this as a way of allowing them to take their huge single cluster and actually make it even bigger, but splitting it into multiple clusters, but still allowing their business to operate the way it had. So they have a verification cluster that has uh, up to 300 agents taking inbound calls that are basically transfers from six separate fronter clusters with over 1,200 total agents, uh, 300, 200 to 300 per. Uh, some of them are smaller than others. Um, the whole system is capable of placing and receiving over 3 million calls a day with up to a half million being transferred over these CCC transfer lines. They can and have added new fronter clusters as needed. Also, they can turn them off like that, uh, which is something you can't do if you have to customize all this. Um, doesn't need any custom programming. They can manage it entirely themselves. They actually did set up that sixth cluster, cross-cluster communication, without even contacting us. So this is entirely self-sustaining, web admin only for them. Um, for more details, you can see the cross-cluster communication document that is part of the open source Vichy Dial code base. Um, it's also available on vichydial.org slash docs. So additional features that we, we kind of needed to add along with this were uh, detailed logging showing both the origination and destination call IDs and lead IDs. That's so you can track where problems happen. 
uh, they'll have they'll put in trouble tickets like, well, this person uh, was disconnected. And then we look it up and like, yeah, the customer disconnected. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the system. We got a normal clearing okay, and then two seconds later it, it, it passed through the logging and all that. But yeah, it was a normal disconnect. Everyone we've looked up has been a normal disconnect. <laughs> we've looked up dozens of them. Very glad we have the detailed logging. Um, we also added an API function, uh, and this really uh, saved a lot of time and effort on their side because they were having issues of fronters not disconnecting when the closer took over the phone call. So we added a function that will actually go and look up who the fronter was, what cluster they came from, send a command to that cluster's API, and issue a command to the agent API that originally fronted this call now this could be going through four servers. The system does it all automatically. So they can issue a leave three-way process that forces that fronter out uh, and lets the verification agent continue uh, without somebody listening in. Uh, so that was another requirement of this project. That's been working flawlessly as well. So that is CCC. Uh, anybody have any questions on CCC? before we go on to the rest of the fun stuff that we have added for this year. Now take a drink of water. No? Okay. <clears throat> All of my European friends' favorite topic, favorite topic of the last year, GDPR. Hooray, data security and privacy. No, not really. It's a mess. <laughs> It's complicated. Yeah, I was more diplomatic in my slide. Um, from the Vici Dial side of things, what we really had to do was add a way to download all customer and contact log data and call recordings all into a single zip file. So we did that. We added that as a feature. Uh, and one step further, we added the ability to delete all of the personal data. That does not include the phone number. Phone number is considered vital logging data under the GDPR, so we can leave that in there. We just won't know who the heck it was we called or anything about them or any of the recordings we had because those can all be deleted. So we added special user permissions. You have to enable this, first of all, in the system. The system has to be enabled to allow the GDPR features. Then on a per user, a per administrative or manager user basis, you have to give the ability to download and then there's another secondary ability to delete uh, and purge that data from the system. So. Uh, those are our GDPR features that we have added. Uh, of course, we have um, hashed passwords, or as we call them, uh, password encryption. Uh, we have up to 100 character length passwords. Um, we have uh, their options to be able to do things like use encrypted MySQL uh, database um, and several other things that uh, our European clients have used with their VichyDAL setups to be uh, what they consider compliant with GDPR. Uh, now I say what they consider because there really are no rules. It's a bunch of general guidelines and then you can hire some very, very expensive consultants to come in and tell you what else you need to do. Um, but the VichyDAL side of things that are only within VichyDAL, uh, we have the privacy rules and the right to be forgotten and the right to the records uh, covered. Uh, this was a big project uh, this year, beginning of this year, inbound preserve place in line. This is something we'd had requested for years. We had a very basic, uh, not really preserve place in line, but callback process uh, that was enabled as a feature. Um, but what we added for one of our clients, what they paid for was the ability to have a customer uh, actually have their queue place preserved, uh, and then they could hang up, and then when their place in line came up, the system will automatically call them back from the next agent that's available to take calls in that in-group. Uh, the customer can also enter in a different phone number to be called back on. Uh, I also don't mention it in here, but we have a way of um, using a, a blacklist of numbers. So for instance, if you're getting call transfers or call forwards that are all coming over with the same caller ID, you can set that as a blacklist for this feature and so then it will force them to enter in a phone number. It won't accept the number that the call was sent over with. Uh, so that is also a feature. Um, 
It basically adding this meant that we had to add a whole new queuing mechanism into the system and we had to make sure all of the other queues within the system were compatible and looked at and listened to the preserved place in line queuing mechanism. So it was a bit of a massive project, but it does work and we have several clients that are using it right now. Uh, with this, um, this wasn't paid for, but we had a couple of clients that had some issues with closing time. <clears throat> Basically, these companies operate like this. Uh, it's 5 p.m. and the agents hang up the phone call that they're on, log out, and leave. Nobody checks to see if anybody's waiting in the queue. They, every day, they always had people waiting in the queue, customers, sometimes for hours. So basically this feature was a way of having the system recognize that a threshold has been passed. It's past 5 p.m. These people are still waiting in the queue. We are going to present them with an option to do something like leave a voicemail message and then we're gonna hang up on them. So we're not gonna let them sit in queue overnight. <laughs> we're actually going to inform them that we have closed uh, and so that's the whole reason that we added inbound closing time. That's a whole set of features and settings uh, in inbound groups. Uh, on the outbound side, we added state and area code shared caller ID groups. Uh, this came out of the, the desire because of uh, higher contact rates of using per area code caller IDs. Like if you're doing, for instance, we poll, do political polling here in Florida. Uh, we have 19, I think it is, caller IDs, or uh, area codes now in the state of Florida. And when we uh, take the effort to actually go through and configure all this, we can set up um, the phone calls to each area code using a caller ID number from each area code. And that results in usually at least a 10% rise in the contact rate or the pickup rate of phone calls. So, of course, we have clients that have been wanting to do this for years. We've had a per campaign based way of doing this, but it was not shareable across campaigns. You couldn't do it per state. It was only per area code and it was not very easy to maintain. So we added something called caller ID groups that allows you to share the same group of caller IDs or move them from campaign to campaign easily. Uh, you can do bulk adding, bulk deleting through uh, the admin utilities. Uh, and it's a lot easier to manage and use now. So that is shared caller ID groups. Uh, this works outside of the US. Caller ID groups can, uh, the area codes can go anywhere from, uh, I think, two digits all the way up to five or six. So it can work in, in other countries that have variable uh, caller ID area codes. Uh, we added the real time whiteboard. This is a ticker type report. Uh, that can update things like uh, total calls, total sales, uh, based on, upon the parameters you select for one campaign, multiple campaigns, or such. So you can see what it looks like, um, your metrics for the day. Uh, this one was fun. <laughs> Waiting call on and off URL. <clears throat> so we have a client um, in South Florida, Boca Raton. They have uh, a couple of inbound queues that uh, they don't always have calls waiting on. You know, it might be an hour between calls and then they might get a whole bunch at once. But what they wanted was uh, the ability for flashing lights to go off in the call center when there were calls waiting in queue for specific in-groups. So uh, we added the ability to integrate with something like this uh, web-enabled power switch. And uh, it was actually fairly complex because you have to leave the light on as long as there are calls in queue. So you can't do it on a per call basis. It has to be on a per cluster basis. Uh, so that's how it works. So if you have one call go into queue and then a second call comes into queue while that first one's waiting and then the first one goes out, that light should stay on the whole time. So it does that and it will actually group together if you use the same uh, URL for multiple in-groups, it will group them together internally, uh, intelligently by itself. But you can have multiple in-groups, multiple lights. I believe they have a blue flashing light and a red flashing light. So it's like the police are in there. If there are a lot of people waiting on hold. 
but it does work. Uh, this little web power switch is, I think, about 180 bucks. Um, very easy to configure. Uh, it it's, even works through wireless. You just have to have a way for the dialer to access it, um, and then it'll work. Uh, this, this actually appeared to be a small change, but took a lot of work. Uh, we rewrote the web admin help to be pop-up bubbles instead of a pop-up screen with everything in it. It's much faster, it is now database-based, and it's prettier. Um, for a few of our clients that were having some TCPA issues, we added integration with DNC.com's uh, filtering uh, API service. So <clears throat> the issue, the, the primary reason we added this was for our clients wanting to filter the frequent litigator list. So uh, DNC.com has this service where they go and search for legal filings and subpoenas for phone numbers. And they gobble, gobble these phone numbers, stick them into a list so that you can block these numbers uh, from coming into your system, just give them a fast busy. Uh, if you're not familiar with the TCPA or, or the havoc it, it has wrecked upon our industry here in the United States, there are basically people who make their living by getting cell phones and then putting in uh, those cell phone numbers into online forms and submitting them everywhere and placing phone calls in the hopes that somebody with an auto dialer will call them back so they can sue them. Because that's what the Telephone Consumer Protection Act allows. So. Uh, this is one way to combat that. Um, we had a client that had been sued three times for calling back people who had called them first, but they used an auto dialer, so they broke the law. So now they're filtering all those. Um, this has been running for, I think, about nine or ten months, and the last I heard, they have not received a single complaint, uh, so it does appear to be working. <laughs> uh, this can be set up system-wide or per DID. Uh, inbound, no agents, no dial. This is a way of regulating the call pacing on an outbound predictive campaign uh, based upon the availability of closer agents. So this is a front or closer scenario. Uh, when there were no closers available, they want the pacing to come down on the front or side. So that's what this feature allows. Uh, manager approved pause codes. This is kind of a minor feature, but uh, it allows you to do things like enter in a pause code of training, but not allow an agent to use it unless a manager actually enters in their credentials on the agent screen. So it's kind of a forced in-person approval for uh, pause code usage. Uh, the switch custom field type, this was a lot of fun. <laughs> this is basically uh, the ability to use multiple custom fields for the same phone call, multiple sets of custom fields. So the application here was insurance. Uh, and we have a client that uh, when they would get somebody on the line, they would talk to them about, for instance, life insurance. And then it might get into homeowner's insurance or it might get into auto insurance. So by clicking the, the buttons at the top of the form, they can actually switch between those alternate forms. All the data is stored in VitriDial uh, in the database and uh, it gives them the ability to offer multiple products, collect multiple sets of information on the same phone call. Scheduled callbacks. We did a lot of work on scheduled callbacks. <laughs> uh, Multi-time zone scheduled callbacks, forced dialing of scheduled callbacks, automatic rescheduling of any one callbacks. Uh, the customer time zone one was especially interesting. Um, this was a client in South Africa paying for it and they were calling people in Australia. Australia has three time zones, but within two of those time zones, they ignore daylight savings time. So there are really five time zones. And so they had to have the ability for the agent to select which area that the customer was in and then select a local time. So then the system would know in the system time when to call them back. Uh, typically before this, uh, it would run entirely on the server time instead of the customer time. Uh, but this is a way of 100% of confirmation from the customer of when to call them back in their local time zone. So that's why we added that. Uh, in other news, uh, we have Asterisk 13 now deployed to pretty much our whole Vici host infrastructure of hundreds of dialers. 
Uh, it is incredibly stable. We use uh, 13.21.2, I think, and has resulted in 20 to 30 percent increase in capacity per server uh, over asterisk 11, which is massive. So we are very happy with the infrastructure of asterisk 13. Of course, if you'd seen our presentation, uh, Mike's presentation last year, we had some headaches in integrating with asterisk 13 because they got rid of local channel resolution. But it turns out local channel, channel resolution was a huge resource hog and is why Astros 13 now runs so much more efficiently. So once we figured out how to mitigate the problem of local channels no longer resolving, uh, we were able to take full advantage of the uh, performance enhancements that Astros 13 had. So we're very happy with it. Um, as far as Vici dial, uh, we, we collect Really, we don't collect any data. Uh, but what this is, is when you do a new install of Vici Dial using Vici Box, it will come to our servers and grab the country code and the area code files, because those are updated several times a year. And we're able to grab the IP address of the requesting server. So we've had over 11,000 unique IP addresses in the last year that did that initial new Vici Dial install. And this is the map of those IPs uh, put on the, uh, across the world. So um, I think I put one up last year of uh, the previous two years installs and uh, we're basically increasing. Uh, we, we've had more in the last year than we had in the previous year. So hooray Vici Dial. And that is it for my presentation. Uh, did anybody have any questions? Any, yay.